Am I high enough? Yeah, you're good. And no, never high. well, it depends. <laughs> depends. <laughs> what kind of high? Okay. And really? Today is October 5th, 2015. I'm Adrian Felace, and it is my honor to be interviewing G. E. Smith for G. the Archive <laughs> for the Archive of American Television. And we're here in New York City, New York. All right, great. All right. We gotta roll. You look a little bit like Emily Dickinson. I love oh. Emily Dickinson. <laughs> Thank you. I have Emily Dickinson guitar picks with her picture on one side and her name on the other oh, side. Oh, really? And people find them on stage and they go, did she play here, Emily Dickinson? <laughs> I know that name. You know. Oh, that's anyway, great. Sorry. No worries. Well, thank you for sitting down with us today, Absolutely. GE. So we'd like to start with just getting a little bit of background information. So what was your name at birth? George Edward Smith. And so how did you come to be known as GE? George Edward Smith was too shy to do what I do, so I had to make up a guy. Really? So I made up GE Smith. Now. When I was a little kid, people in my family called me Jeej. Um, maybe that was in my head, you know. Mm -hmm. But it was because I, I needed somebody to go out and do the work, and I couldn't do it. So at what point did you kind of develop that persona? Probably when I was about 20, in the, in the 70s. Okay. Well, we'll definitely get there and talk more about that. Um, when and where were you born? I was born in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, January 27, 1952. And did you grow up in that area as well? I did. My parents still live in the house I grew up in. What were your parents' names and what did they do for a living? Uh, my, my mother's name is Loree, L-O-R-E-E. -E. And my father's name is Richard. Uh, my father, when I was a little, little kid, he was driving a truck picking up mushrooms from mushroom farms. And then he eventually, he was a very clever man, very intelligent man. He put himself through night school and um, wound up as the vice president of a big manufacturing company. He became an engineer. And my mom, uh, I grew up in the house also with my grandmother. She lived up, there was a separate apartment upstairs. and. Uh, my father's mother. She had owned a, a, a gift shop, Holiday Gift Center, downtown Strasburg. And my mother worked with her down there at the store, but you know, she took care of me and my brothers. How many brothers did you have? Two brothers. One uh, is two years younger, and one is 13 years younger. Oh, wow. and, uh, Gregory, my brother, is two years younger. He's an engineer as well. I believe he's a chemical engineer lives out near Chicago. And my brother Jimmy, Jimmy Smith Auto Sales, Bath, Pennsylvania. Or was it Wingap? Anyway, um, he sells uh, used cars. What traits do you think you inherited from your parents? What traits? Um, from, from my, my mother was, she always uh, taught me, um, both of them were very big on making me learn to read. When I, 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 my father, I, I, there's a picture of me and my dad when I'm three years old. I'm sitting on his lap and we've got the newspaper. And I, I'm pointing at the words because he says that I could read then like the headlines. Like, I like Ike, you know, it's White Eisenhower um, is, is what I'm reading. We used to go and uh, wait for the train to come with the paper in the evening. The old Journal American, an old New York paper that's gone. And um, that would come in, and we'd get the hot off the train, and we'd read the paper together. And my mother always showed me these, she had a lot of those big coffee table books with photographs of like Muir Woods, and that was one she had, and um, the deserts out in Utah, you know, and uh, stuff like that, you know. So she gave me this sense of wonder, and my father gave me the sense of like diligence. What, what were some of your interests when you were a little kid? Um, I expect just being a little kid, you know, food. My grandmother, my father's mother, she's Lebanese. My father's Lebanese. And um, so there was a big extended Lebanese family in the town. 
all her brothers and their families, my grandmother's brothers and their families. So I grew up with lots of that Lebanese thing around. Uh, when I was a real little kid, we had some relatives in Scranton, and we'd go there, and uh, there was still a couple of the old people, old Uncle Tom. He sat on the porch and read the Arabic language newspaper. You know, a couple of the old ones still spoke Arabic, so I heard that when I was little, and I liked that. You know, I thought, oh, that's cool. Um, and the, the food was a big thing. And then when I was four, I got one of these, and that was it. How did you Everything get a else was canceled, and it was this. So how did you get your first guitar? I uh, went down in the basement with my mom. She was doing the laundry. I said, what's that hanging on the wall there? What is that? She said, oh, that used to belong to your Uncle George, one of my grandmother's brothers. And uh, I don't know. It's a guitar. What? I said, can I play with it? Yeah, sure. She takes it down and gives it to me, and I just went crazy. It was in the summertime, and I remember I took it out in the backyard, and I laid it like this on the ground, and I laid down, and I would go. And I'd hit those, those low strings and watch them vibrate. And at some point, I understood that the vibration made the sound. Before, right? And the whole world snapped into place. The, the edges of buildings against the sky and the airplane going across the sky is not the sky, it's an airplane. You know, when you're a tiny little kid, you're just this ball of, boom. well, that was the moment for me where it all went bang. This is you in this space, and everything else is not you. So did you take lessons? There, there was, this is in the 50s, in this little town in Pennsylvania, there was nothing. There was nobody to take lessons from. There were no other guitar players, certainly that, my parents knew or anybody knew. But when I was seven, now by, by the time I was seven, I had figured out, I knew the names of the strings, and I had figured out some little chords. I don't know how. Maybe my parents bought me a book. I don't remember that. They must have. How else could I? I couldn't have just pulled it out of the air. I knew how to tune the guitar. The summer when I'm seven, 1959, I'm sitting out in the yard, and my uncle George, who that guitar used to belong to, comes over and he's got this uh, girlfriend. And she looks at me and she says, oh, do you want a real guitar? It was a real junker, you know, the one. Seven, I go, sure. Next day she shows up with a, a good guitar, a Martin. You know, this little mahogany-bodied Martin. And more importantly, a 13-year-old Irish girl who was working for her that summer as like an au pair kind of arrangement, you know, over from Ireland. And she taught me to finger pick. You know, you can play a guitar with a pick, right? I don't have a pick with me, but, you know, just by around up and down, pick the strings. Or you can, what they call finger picking, where you do the bass and the melody at the same time. You know, that's what this girl taught me. I was so lucky to learn that when I was seven, you know, and not have to wait till years later. So that was a big influence. I still have the pieces of paper where she wrote. This, uh, words to songs out, these old Irish songs. She had this one, Mari's Wedding, Step We Gaily On We Go, Heel For Heel and Toe For Toe. You know? I remember her singing it. I wish I knew her name, Red Hair. <laughs> of course, I was totally in love with her. You know? <laughs> she was 13. She was all grown up. And uh, yeah, so that's what happened. So who were some of your earliest musical influences? Who were you listening to? Well, my grandmother, see, I was just lucky. You know, I don't think I have any very special talent. I was lucky and I was game. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, was, I was supremely lucky, always. Things like that would happen. Somebody would just walk in the yard that didn't even know me and give me a guitar and a girl to show me how to play it. Come on, you know? Um, so my earliest musical influences, my grandmother, and this is where the love part comes in, my grandmother loved people like Louis Armstrong. Nat King Cole, Duke Ellington. She had those records. And I was with her all the time because she was right upstairs. And I loved my grandmother. Siti, we call it, Arabic word for grandmother, you know? And uh, so I'd hear those records. Those are the first, that's the first music I can remember, you know? And that's good music. Mm -hmm. Nat King Cole, you know, mm -hmm. I'm listening. I'm listening to Duke Ellington. I'm listening to Louis Armstrong. 
And my dad loved a little bit later, but that same kind of stuff, the band, big band stuff. He liked Louis Prima. And he had this great singer named Keely Smith. And I was fascinated that her name was Smith, too. I knew Smith was just a dumbass, regular name, you know. But um, I was fascinated by her and would listen and would listen to how she moved those notes around. Cause she was a real artist at that. So that was the early music I remember. So were you trying to imitate that sound on the guitar? No, no, that music was so far beyond me, mm -hmm. but I knew that it was good. Mm -hmm. And I knew that that was something to aspire to, although I didn't know the word aspire at the time. <laughs> what about on the radio at that time? Were you listening to anyone? Well, in our little town, before 1959, I think, in my memory, is when this happened, we didn't have, we had the one radio station, WVPO, the Mighty 590. Mighty 590. Um, they didn't play. They didn't play no rock and roll, let me tell you that for sure. Um, you heard, I mean, Perry Como. Uh, the most saccharine. American pop music of the of the time, you know, and even of a of a earlier time, in in the fifties when I became aware of music, they were probably playing stuff from the very early fifties and the the immediate post war period, late forties, you know, Glenn Miller, that kind of stuff. Which which now I know there's some good music in there, but at the time it just sounded cornball to me, and that didn't move me. But that stuff my grandmother was playing, the black music moved me. Mm -hmm. That's what I heard. So how did you get exposed to rock and roll and some other sounds? Well, eventually. Now I got older cousins because I got this great big family. And uh, at one point, I'm over at Uncle Eddie's house, and he's got Rosemary and Mary Ann, my cousins, his daughters. Again, one of my grandmother's brothers, Uncle Eddie. And Mary Ann plays me this record, Rebel Rouser, by Dwayne Eddy. And it's this cool electric guitar. He's playing way back in a cave somewhere, you know, and you're outside listening to it. Well, I, that, I just went, <laughs> give me that, I don't want that. Because before that, you know, I had an acoustic guitar. And uh, in the late 50s, early 60s, there was the, you know, the folk music, what they call folk music, you know. Um, that was going on. So I was hearing that also from my cousins. And, um, but when I heard that electric guitar, that was probably around 1960. Mm -hmm. The record had been out for a couple years, but she played me that record. She gave me the record. I still had 45, you know. So did you play in any bands as a like preteen teenager? I played in a in a when I was in seventh grade. How old are you when you're in seventh grade? Like 12, 13. Yeah, 11, 12, 13. Well, my daughter's 13 and she's in eighth grade. Yeah, so I was maybe 12. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a little band with a couple of buddies of mine, but I had also done some playing earlier with some local people because the, the rock thing is starting to come in, you know? Uh, in 59 or 60, they finally ran a cable over the mountain and we got TV and other radio stations and stuff. So now people are hearing the bigger, wider American thing that's going on. You know, rock's been happening for a while. In a lot of people's minds, rock and roll's already dying by the 1960, you know? Um, so yeah, I played with, with some people probably when I was 11. And, uh, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. So was it? But I, that wasn't like what you would call, like being in an organic band, and I didn't do that until I was 13. So what was the band at 13? Though? The one when I was 13 was called the Rubber Chicken. Good name. Good name. <laughs> we had one of those rubber chickens that we would hang on, you know, on the thing. And that was like with some guys that I was in high school with. Nice. We played, um, that would have been in 65. You know, we probably started that, um, that year in school. The, the 64, 65 school year was when we had that band. And I don't remember how long it lasted. 
my dad had um, business cards printed up for the band <laughs> at the place he worked because they had the machine, you know, that they could print it up. It was this very cool thing that opened up. It was black on the front. It said the rubber chicken. And then you opened it up and it had our, our nicknames. You know, Smitty, mine was. <laughs> Yak, Bo. So when you finally got television, what kind of stuff did you start watching? My parents um, would watch stuff. I didn't, I would only watch like, you know, music stuff and then I'd watch, you know, Walt Disney, you know. What was some of the music stuff you were watching? Um, well, the stuff then was the folk thing. There was uh, this show called Hootenanny that was on. And they would go around to colleges and film that. And, um, We spoke about this for a second before we started doing the interview, and I've, I've been thinking about it. And, and in my memory, I know I went and saw one. They told me, and I'm, my memory is that it was in Princeton because it wasn't far away. Princeton's not that far away from where we were. It couldn't have been anywhere else. And I remember that my cousin who took me, she had a boyfriend that went to Princeton, and that's why we went there. And he was on like the entertainment committee. So we got in and got like to you know go up front and kind of watch what was going on. So she thought it would be cool to take me there. And so I went and saw that, and I saw um, Josh White and Odetta, and maybe Ian and Sylvia. I know that there was a woman and a man duo that that played. They were Canadian, and they they did some nice music back then. So. That was amazing for me to see that, mm -hmm. you know? That was probably, that was when I was no more than nine or 10. Wow. And um, then I didn't start seeing rock and roll bands, you know, till probably 65, because by then now, I'm in a band, there's other bands in town, there's some older guys in high school, you know, that have bands. Um, There was a band called the Vestels, because they wore vests. And um, I had been playing for a while, you know, and I was really into it. And there's these things called bar chords, where you cover all six strings, right? So I knew this bar chord. And this is very kind of basic and very useful, you know? But it, it's, a, it's a mountain to climb when you're first starting to play, to learn that. Because you got to is a lot. It's intricate with your fingers. What's going on? You need a lot of power in your first finger, which you develop over time. For a little kid, that was a real, you know, I got somewhere when I learned how to play the bar. I knew there was another bar chord shape, but I didn't quite know what it was. This has to be earlier than that because by '65, I certainly knew them all. So now, because uh, I went to the YMCA in the afternoon and saw a dance. So how old am I? Ten, eleven? You know. Anyway, and I go to see the Vestels, and they sound great, and I'm listening, and I see him do this, and I go, that's the other bar chord, and then that, then I was really off and running. Because you were just studying when you saw people play them. Yes. Yep. There was, there wasn't even, well, there, was, there was like some old corny music stores in town, you know, like accordions and piano music stores, but they didn't start having guitars in stores where I lived until that same kind of period, early 60s, you know, 63, 64, when the Beatles came and that, then people had to have guitars in stores. So I, then I could go down to a, a guitar store and there was a guy, I think his name was Rusty Reimer, you know, a real like kind of country Pennsylvania guy. And he could play, he could play like Chet Atkins kind of stuff. And I saw him a couple times at the music store and I just I didn't say anything, you know, I just watched him. Mm -hmm. Okay. So did you know from a pretty young age then that you wanted to be a professional musician? I didn't care about professional. I didn't care about any of that. I just wanted to play. I, I knew I, that I was going to play. I mean, it was, is there a word beyond obsession? Because that's what it was, you know, it was just zit. That was it. My mom tells a story now. A mom will tell a story about their child that makes that child kind of remarkable, you know, that maybe it's just out of her mother's love that she's telling that story. But she always says that when I was quite young, nine, I'm playing some books, that I'd sit in the kitchen and I'd start playing songs 
And she'd go, where'd you learn that? And I'd go, I don't know, I just know it. And there were songs, my mother was an orphan, and she was kind of kicked around from different families, Ohio, Pennsylvania, you know, and country, you know. And um, she said there were songs from the 30s when she was a little girl. And how did I know those? Like I say, that's a mother's memory. You know? mm -hmm. I must have heard them somewhere. Mm -hmm. But I liked that music. I like that, that resonated with me. Do you recall what your first like paid professional gig was? Yeah, absolutely. We played for a, a little girl's birthday party when I was seventh grade. Oh wow! Fifth grade. Fifth grade. Yeah, because it was with Walt and Tom Polinsky, and uh, one of them was in my class, and one of them was younger. We we couldn't play. I mean, we were ridiculous but the mom wanted a little something special for her daughter and so we played at that party and I think we got um, five bucks to split between the three of us nice. which was money mm -hmm. in those days you mm -hmm. know for for little guys you know ten year olds or something yeah so let's jump ahead a little to your teen years in 1969 did you go to Woodstock I went to Woodstock tell us about that um, Woodstock was Friday Saturday and Sunday three days of peace and music, as it says on the ticket, which I still have. And um, where it was located, where we lived in Pennsylvania, we could go up the back way. I had to work on Friday. I was working for Uncle Eddie, delivering produce. And um, so I couldn't go on Friday. And my buddies that I was going with couldn't go on Friday either. They must have been working too. So we left real early Saturday morning, about 5 o'clock, and they already had on the radio and stuff that all the roads are closed, you can't get near it. But my friend Eric, his dad, had told us to go up, you know. And um, so we went up the back way, and, and we drove right up to within a, probably half a mile of the stage. Just left the pickup truck on the side of the road, and we walked in, and boom, there we were. Yeah, so it was great. It was amazing see all those bands. Did anyone stick out for you in particular? Oh, a bunch of them stick out. Um, Saturday afternoon, I think it was Saturday afternoon that they played Santana, who we didn't know about yet on the East Coast. That was, that was a revelation. We had never heard anything with like a Latin feel, mm -hmm. you know, when he had those drummers, those conga drummers. Um, and just, he played great and it was, it was good. They had good songs and they were, they were a really good band. Um, there was a band called Mountain with this fantastic guitar player named Leslie West. And uh, that was their first gig. It was the first place they ever played was Woodstock. They were powerful. Uh, the Who, of course, I'd already seen The Who a bunch of times by then. And that, they were a big influence on me, Pete Townsend. Bunch of good stuff. Mm -hmm. So then in the early 70s, you moved to Connecticut. Yeah, I moved to Connecticut when I was 19, yeah, when I was 19, because again, I was, um, I was afraid to come directly to New York, and I knew that's where I needed to be by then, if I was going to get in a really good band. And New York was not that far away from us, it, 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 it's like 70 miles, you know, 75 miles or something but it's worlds away, you know, from that little valley there where I grew up. So uh, my, my buddy Gillette Durkee, who was a keyboard player, Hammond organ player, he had gone to Vietnam and uh, not on vacation. And uh, when he got out, he went up to New Haven University on like a GI Bill kind of thing. And he got in a band up there and he called me up one summer and he said, uh, hey, our guitar player is sick. He's going to be out for a couple weeks at operation or something. He said, can you come up and fill in for him? I said, sure. And I went up and that was that. I never went, never went back. I was supposed to teach school. I was supposed to be an English teacher, you know, because my mom always wanted me. She made me promise to finish school, you know, because by then I was, you know, by the time I was 13, 14, 15, it was obvious that this was all I was ever going to do. So that's how I wound up in Connecticut. Mm 
-hmm. to let Durkee. And then when and for what did you finally move to New York? Um, well, there we were in Connecticut. There was a train. You know, <laughs> it was easy. I didn't even have to drive. So after a few, I loved Connecticut. I loved it. You know, um, I got in, in a in a good band. After a little while, and we played a lot. You know, I have my old calendars from seventy four, seventy five. We're playing 240 nights a year, you know. Um, I got a little apartment, I got a car, I got a girlfriend, you know. And, and I'm making three, 400 a week. Mm -hmm. Hey, come on, who's better than me today, right? <laughs> so, so that was great. So I stayed there for a while. And um, I just started coming to New York after a while. By like 70... Six seventy seven. Coming into New York, and uh, going to see bands, mm -hmm. and it was it was great, you know. See these, what was happening, what was starting to happen in the punk thing, and you know. And then in nineteen seventy nine, you played guitar for Gilda Radner's Broadway show, Gilda Live. Yep. How did that come about? In seventy eight, I had gone on the road. I had auditioned for and gotten a job with a band called Desmond Child and Rouge. Desmond, good songwriter. He later wrote a lot of songs, like with Aerosmith, Bon Jovi. You know, he's written a lot of big hit songs. Dude Looks Like a Lady. Desmond was in on that one. Uh, but a lot of big songs. Anyway, Desmond Child and Rouge. Rouge were these three women vocalists. Great people. It was a big band. And the cool thing was, there was a, a, lat, a Latina thing going on in that band. Um, so that was a nice influence. They were from, from Florida, from South Florida, Cuban. There was a you know, Cubana thing going on. Uh, there was a guy named Gilmore de Gap, Conguero. And uh, so I played in that band. Then the Rouge Girls, then I'm, by then I'm living in New York. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm doing little things, you know. Back in those days, there was still a lot of recording, a lot of recording studios and things going on. So it was pretty easy if you were like the fresh meat in town. That's what they always wanted, you know. That's what they still want here. You know, they want to grind you up and get the next guy, you know. But I was the new guy, so I started getting a lot of work, working in the studios, running around. And uh, the Ruse Girls got the job with Gilda. I don't know how they got that job to do this Broadway one-woman show, to be singers and also act a little bit in the thing. And they recommended to the people that were running the show that I should be allowed to audition for the band. So I came up and, and uh, I got the job. Lucky, lucky again. And lucky I knew those girls, right? That's how it works, you know, you know this one. And then you meet somebody at a party, and then they go, hey, you know him? Yeah, okay. You know her, really? Okay. Then you must be all right. If she likes you, you must be all right. Come on. Um, so that's how I got onto Gilda's show. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about Gilda Radner. What was she like to work with? Oh, she was great. Very professional. And, you know, by then she was big, huge. Mm -hmm. She'd been on Saturday Night Live for four years, and yeah. she was major in America. You know, what would I compare her to now? You know, I don't know. Amy, what's her name? Schuler? Schuler? Is that oh, how you say her name? Amy Schumer? Schumer? Yeah. Amy. Maybe somebody like that, although these are different times and fame is a different thing now. Fame was not so ubiquitous then. You know, be before the internet, not everyone was famous. Mm -hmm. And if somebody had gotten that lucky break and worked that hard to get to be famous, it kind of really was special, you know? So, but she was very talented, very intelligent, and also very silly and funny, mm -hmm. you know? She wasn't one of those comedians that was on all the time. Some of them, you know, uh, that I got to know afterwards through her, you know, they're always on. You know, Belushi was always on. Robin Williams was always on. Hysterically funny. Mm -hmm. and, but after a while, you were like, man, let me breathe, you know? Mm -hmm. They never stopped, but yeah, she was, she was great. Just a nice person. 
So had you seen her on Saturday Night Live? Sure. Oh, everybody. Yeah. Who didn't watch Saturday Night Live, you know? And also, they had bands on Saturday Night Live, so you'd always tune in to see who was, who was playing that week. What did you think of some of the early musical performances on SNL? I thought it was wonderful because it was live. You know, by then, I was already kind of at a point in the business where I knew that you went on in mind. You know, lip syncing, they called it. You'd sing along with your record and just pretend like you were playing. And I, I would always get a kick out of bands that I'd see on shows that were lip syncing and were doing things that only musicians would get to kind of undermine the process, to mock themselves. I like self-deprecating humor, you know? Uh, I, to mock themselves and the process of, you know, we're just here selling our record, and you know it, and you know what, you know, what's mm -hmm. going on. I love seeing that. I was always a big fan of doing stuff like that because of what I'd been influenced by yeah. seeing that. So you played with uh, David Bowie in the 1980s, too. Very, very briefly, um, uh, Dave, I met David at a party. And uh, the next day, I think, he, had, he was filming the video for Fashion, the song Fashion, and he needed some weird-looking people for the video. So he saw me at a party. In those days, I had a crew cut. I used to go to the, uh, everybody had long hair then. The men had long hair. And I would go to the barber and say, make it look like I just joined the Marines. You know, it was that short, skin on the sides and barely on top. And uh, David saw me and he thought, oh, there's a weird looking guy. And he said, uh, what are you doing tomorrow? I said, Nothing. He said, well, come down. Uh, we're filming this video. And then at some point, either later in the party or later that night, he said, oh, you play the guitar. Somebody told him I was a guitar player. He said, bring your guitar, and we'll film you, you know. Because the, the guy who had played the record, Robert Fripp, wasn't there. He wasn't much of a video guy, Fripp. So uh, that's how I got that with David. And then we went to Los Angeles soon after that. We put together a little band here in New York of just some guys, some of his guys, and I got a drummer and maybe a bass player. And uh, we went to Los Angeles and we did the last hour and a half Tonight Show, the Johnny Carson show at that time. It was the last hour and a half one. And I remember Richard Pryor was on the show. And I was in makeup and Johnny Carson came in and was in the next chair, you know. I was like, whoa, this is quite some Mr. Carson. He goes, hey, you here with uh, Mr. David? I said, yeah. Oh, good, okay. Have a good time. <laughs> but that was very cool. Did you chat with Richard Pryor at all? Yes. And then uh, over the years, um, got to do several things where Richard was around. And he was always very genuine and, and nice and very funny, but smart. Mm -hmm. All these guys are the comedians, the men and the women that are really funny. They're smart people, big intelligence. You know, they walk in a room and they just get everybody in the room. And that's why they can be funny about it. Now, you also played lead guitar with Hollow Notes in the that, late 70s, early 80s. That I did. How did you join the group? Got in there again. Desmond Chaudon Rouge, the drummer, was a guy from South Florida named Eddie Zine. He, at one time, had played with Daryl and John, mid 70s. When I was up in Connecticut, he was doing some stuff with Gerald and John. He had dropped by the studio. This was the same summer, summer of 79, I think, or 78. No, 79. 79. He had gone by the studio where they were recording, and they were having some trouble with their, the people that they had had playing guitar. They weren't bringing what they wanted. Sometimes you can't really define it musically. You go, I got this sound in my head, you know. And um, Eddie said, well, you should, you should listen to this guy, you know. Uh, I worked with him, and, you know, he's a nice guy. He's pretty good. So uh, Eddie called me and said, can you come by the studio tomorrow? And I used to sleep on Eddie's floor on Carmine Street when I first came to town, before I got my first place. Yeah. And... Uh, 
you know, come to the studio tomorrow. So I'm going to go to the studio, but I get a call first, I think, from Daryl or maybe from their office. Can you go to Daryl's apartment? He wants to like an audition. You know, okay, sure. So I go to Daryl's place and I walk in and um, Daryl's, when Daryl's not on stage, he's very shy. Another guy's very smart, very talented, you know, had this gift from when he was a little kid. His mother was a voice coach. So she had him in the high chair going, me, 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 yo, 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 you know. So the great gift he already had, she developed it and, and he took it somewhere. So anyway, I go to Daryl's apartment and I walk in and I used to like take pains with my clothes in those days, you know, in the 70s here in New York. So I had some cool clothes on. And of course, Daryl had cool clothes. And I walk in and he goes, hey, where'd you get that shirt? You know, we start talking about clothes. And then, oh, we're both from Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. The guitar never came out of the case. We just talked and it was like, okay, yeah, you're the guy, you're in. So that was it. Nice. And then actually you guys were on Saturday Night Live as musical guests in 82, I think? I, uh, yes, we were. What was that like to be on that side? don't remember. <laughs> I've done so many TV yeah. shows now. It was a TV show. We walked yeah. in, there's wires, there's people that work there, there's cameras, there's lights, there's a little audience. So right. It didn't resonate with me because we were, by then, Hall & Oates were getting huge and we were running all around the world like nine, ten months a year wow. and really doing a lot of stuff. So wow. I wish I could tell you more. <laughs> that's okay. So that's I do remember um, having a brief chat with Eddie Murphy. Yeah. At that time. That's something that I do remember. And, uh, of course, the Saturday Night Live people were aware of me because of the Gilda connection. Me and Gilda were married for a few years. And um, so Eddie, and Eddie was sitting there going over a script or something. And he went, hey. You know, and we talked for a moment, a yeah. nice little. But he was great. He was genuine and focused. So then, 1985, you became the music director for Saturday Night Live. Yes. So how did that come about? Um, Daryl and John had decided, we had done six years of very intense recording and touring, and they had gotten huge and done really well, you know? They'd written a lot of great songs, and that had all worked out. MTV started in, I think, April of 81, came on. And MTV used to be just videos. Music television, MTV stands for. But it used to just be just music. And I'm not saying it's better or worse. I'm just saying that's what it was when it first came out. Tommy Mottola, who was Daryl and John's manager, knew the guys that were starting MTV. We were ready. We had seven or eight videos in the can, ready to go. We were among the first 10 videos played the night that they came on. I remember we were playing in Ames, Iowa and at the University of Iowa, and we finished the show, rushed back to the hotel to watch our video <laughs> on this new cool thing, MTV. So uh, I'm sorry I got off. The, no, no, no. That's what was a great the question? Um, how you became music director. But actually, oh. let's stay on that for a second, though. What was it like to make those music videos with Hollow Notes? It was fun, you know, they're little baby movies. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of it being a six month shoot, it's a one night shoot or a two day shoot maybe, you know. But it's the same thing. It's the makeup, it's the cameras, it's the trucks, it's, it's um, you know, yeah. catering. What do they call catering in the movies? Uh, crafty. Crafty, yeah, <laughs> that stuff. It's, it's all that. It's all those people. It's the unions, it's the guys, you know. And I love all that stuff. I love all the little workings of of the entertainment business, you know? Um, I never, and I abhor people that think because they're the talent that they are something special. I fucking hate that. And I don't stay long with people that act like that, you know? Mm -hmm. The people that are driving those trucks, if they didn't drive that truck, you wouldn't have a show because your stuff wouldn't be there. So, you know, get off it. I hate that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, the videos were, were fun. 
we had fun. You got to, you know, be somebody else and wear makeup. And we did some really fun, silly videos with Daryl and John, you know. So that's G.E. Smith. That's the persona G.E. Smith. That was G.E. Smith for sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, George was, he was hiding somewhere. <laughs> yeah. All right, so then Saturday Night Live, how did you get that gig? Um, okay, so through my time with Gilda, I got to know Howard Shore, Lauren Michaels. They, um, Howard Shore was the original band leader of Saturday Night Live. Howard Shore in the all nurse band. 300 pound black guys in nurses uniforms. Yeah. Um, okay, 250 pounds, sorry. Uh, Lauren was the creator and producer. You know, the, still is the, uh, the brains behind SNL. So I knew them. So uh, Lauren started the show. 75 to 80, it's Lauren. 80, he needs a break. He wants to stop. So he leaves. Pretty sure there was a woman named Jean Dumanian who took over. Uh, somebody did. I think it was her. And uh, anyway, Lauren's gone. So I'm playing with Hall and Oates. And I'm busy. I'm running around the world. And I kind of lose touch. You know, me and Gilda aren't together anymore. And I kind of lose touch with my old Saturday Night Live friends. Then in um, 85, spring of 85, we finish a tour. We do the Live Aid show, which was a big television thing. And by then I was doing my band leader routine, you know. GE was doing his band leader routine, you know, directing the bands and stuff. Um, so Daryl and John, are, we're done. They got, they're tired, they need time off. Lauren is about to come back to Saturday Night Live. He's had enough time off, NBC wants him back. He kind of wants to go back, I think. And. Um, he gets a hold of Howard, who has now become a major film score guy. Howard's doing big, you know, Hollywood major films. Uh, Lauren says, we're going back on the air. Howard, I need you. And Howard goes, can't do it. I got this career now. This is real, you know. And Howard has since come on to, you know, be a, you know, the, the, the best. He's one of the very top guys and one of the greatest, you know. Um, Howard helped me a lot in the beginning when I first came to New York and we became friends. He really helped me a lot. I owe, I owe him a lot. Um, so anyway, Howard came to it. Lauren says, what, what am I going to do? You know? And he says, well, get GE. You know him. He's a kind of a band leader guy. You know, he'll do it. So that's how that happened. So what were your duties as music director? Um, I was the, the band leader guy it was weird because it's um, there was there were a lot there were it was fragmented the music department did a lot of things there were uh, people that worked with me uh, Cheryl Hardwick was a wonderful piano player great musician and became one of my greatest friends uh, she would do a lot of the music for the, the skits for the, the comedy bits there was a guy named Hal Wilner who had this massive record collection, thousands and thousands of recordings of every type of music from all over the world. If they needed stuff, you know, okay, this is, this is a thing that takes place in Borneo in the 40s. Yeah, I've got those records from Borneo in the 40s. Here, here's the background music. You know? and that's one of the reasons why that show worked was because Lauren was smart enough to get the right people. That's one of his gifts. Um, the other great gift that I always say that Lauren has that most people don't know about, he's a real estate genius. Really? I think he's even better at real estate than he is at entertainment, but he <laughs> might argue with that. <laughs> yeah, he's a genius. He knows when to buy like 15 years before anybody else. He knows what to buy. Anyway. Um, well, what was Lauren like personally? Just Oh, you know. for... Uh, for a bunch of years, we were good friends. You know, I lived right near him and... and you know, we hung out a lot and we had some nice times. We did a little traveling together and stuff a couple times. Mm -hmm. Very nice guy. You know, um, like anybody, 
that has a position where there's dozens of people relying on them for their bread, right? Both figuratively and literally. That's hard. Because sometimes you got to let some of them go. He had to let me go. And he actually called me up. He didn't have somebody else do it. And I always got to hand it to him. He called me up and said, well, you know, it's, it's, all, it's all over after I did it for 10 years. And at the time, of course, I was shocked because uh, what are we going to do without all that money? Things work out, you know. So I, and I hold no rancor towards Lauren. He was good to me. You know. Yeah. So let's talk about um, who did you bring into the band and kind of how did you assemble it? Howard already had a bunch of people that he knew. Some of the people had been there. Leon Pendarvis, who's a, a keyboard player as well. Great, great musician. Leon helped me so much musically. Mm -hmm. So when I got there, I was this bar band guy, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. I had played with Daryl and John and done stadiums, but stadiums are just big bars as far as the musicians are concerned. You know? um, so Leon was already there. Some of the horn players were already there. Then we auditioned some people as well. I think Howard already knew Lenny Pickett, who's there now, the saxophone player. I think Howard already knew him and we already had him. But I remember we auditioned some of the other people in the band. Um, I don't know, does anybody care about this stuff? <laughs> It's Who okay. cares? There's guy, they're guys. Like it's the New specifics. York. There's a lot of people that play, and some of them wound up in that <laughs> band. They're all aces. If yeah. you're in that band, you've got to be pretty good. They were all far better musicians than I am, or certainly than I was at the time. I mean, I was pitiful. These guys, you know, they used to say, well, I studied private. <laughs> it's a little musician's joke. So. so how would you describe the sound of the band during your tenure there? Well, Howard is a, uh, was initially a saxophone player. He also studied composition. He's a conductor and can write scores for orchestras. You know, he's a real musician. I can't do that stuff. Um, so he had been in a band in Canada called Lighthouse, and they had had a couple of hits, both in Canada and the United States. They had one big song in the United States. And it was a horn band. You know, big horn section. So he wanted a, a horn band. He wanted that sound because it, it's classy. You know, you, you can denote a certain, you know, music is emotive. You can, that's why they use it in films as underscoring because a good film score person like Howard or like Carter Burwell is another great friend of mine, you know, did Twilight and he does the Coen Brothers movies and stuff. Um, they have that knack of you can amplify the emotion or you can damp down the emotion in a scene if you want to. So Howard and Lauren must have talked, but I think it was pretty much Howard's thing, that, that type of band. And also it drew on the Ray Charles big band of the 50s and 60s. It definitely drew on that band. That, I think that was Howard's template. So you said kind of playing in bar bands and studios was kind of the same feel? Stadiums. Stadium, sorry. Did that differ? Studios is very different. Yeah, so tell us, how did it feel to play in a live studio like that? Um, because I was comfortable there, because I had been there. I think if I had come in cold, I'd have really been terrified. I was terrified, but I'd have been, you know, in, inanimate mm -hmm. when I got there. If it hadn't been that I had already spent a lot of time in the studio, knew Lauren, you know, I knew the boss. So how much trouble can I get in? Right? I figured they were going to send me home after the first week. I really did. Because these other guys were so much better musicians than me, Cheryl and, and everybody in the band. Uh, it was really fun because not only are they great musician, musicians, these are the real cats in New York. When I was a kid, along with listening to all that stuff, I would look at pictures of all those old bands from the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. And I go, that's what I want to be. I want to be one of the cats. You know, I want to play. I want to play really good. But that was almost more important. 
that I wanted to be. And all of a sudden, now here I am among them. So that was a joy for me to be there. Do you remember your first live performance on the show? I don't remember the first one. I remember one of the very first ones. Uh, we, we, at first, we were up in a sort of a crow's nest thing, up over the stage, up over the uh, stage left. And Harry Dean Stanton was the, the host. And there was a scene where he was supposed to climb up a ladder he plays harmonica really well. He was supposed to climb up a ladder and get into the crow's nest with us and play. Um, well, Harry had a little trouble at the top of the ladder, you know, so I had to help him into the... Or he might have just played from the ladder. I, it didn't quite go, but I remember that, and that might have been the second or third show. Mm -hmm. It might have been the first one. I don't remember mm -hmm. specifically the first. Talk a little bit about your setup there in Studio 8H, the space that you guys had with the band. Well, at first we had the crow's nest. Mm -hmm. I think that might have only been one year. Then we moved down to where the band pretty much still is now, center stage. So then there's a stage left area for comedy. There's a stage right area for the guest band, whoever's on that week. And there's whatever they can utilize in the studio. There's only 150 people in the audience, at least in my time there. Um, so they use every bit of space to make, to set up uh, scene, you know, scenery for staging. Uh, one hysterical thing that happened. Okay, so st stage right from us is the guest band spot. So this Irish band, the Pogues, is on. And uh, Shane McGowan, the singer, in that band is a pretty notorious drink and drug guy, you know. So the Pogues came, and they, were, they sounded great, you know, at the rehearsal and stuff, and Shane seemed to be pretty together. There's a scene, a comedy scene in the show, it's like an Old West bar thing. So they build a bar. You know, I love being, seeing that stuff, like they, they tell the carpenters, we need a bar from 1848, you know, okay, bang, 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 there it is, you know, it's 1848 over there. Anyway, there's this bar, and there's an actor from New York, some, you know, you know, handsome New York guy is the bartender, dressed in Western gear or whatever it was. Shane comes out to do one of the numbers, Joe Dixo, who was the stage manager, is looking at his watch, 30 seconds, and Shane sees the bar goes off stage, walks over to the bar and goes, whiskey! And the guy goes, uh, it's not, that's tea in those bottles, it's not, whiskey! You know, that was hysterical. Hmm. Well, you... What are we talking about? I'm just <laughs> off the line. Um, talk a little bit about what you would play in and out of commercial breaks, because we would see you guys in the band there. That was the great favor that Lauren did for me. He created that. They called it band shots. And it would come to the end of the show is 90 minutes and it's divided into a bunch of segments and in between each of those segments is however many minutes of commercial break. Because that's how they make their money and sell the things and enable it all to go on just by selling the commercial time. So Lauren, uh, the comedy pieces or of a certain length, and sometimes there'd be eight seconds of just dead air. Well, what are they gonna do? You know, okay, I know what we'll do, Lauren says. Let's get the band to start playing. Because we would always play on those commercial breaks anyway, for the people in the house. And he says, we'll just start as soon as the other thing's over. Joe Dick's old signal, and boom, and you hit it. So that's what we started doing. Mm -hmm. And it became a thing somehow. I don't know how. I mean, I was there with my buddy T-Bone from Hall & Oates, your departed T-Bone. Uh, we were... I don't know what's the word. We were uh, archetypal enough American characters that it caught with people. T-Bone always had the hat. He kind of looked like a guy from Vermont that did this when he was talking to you. You know, and um, 
we were on the Simpsons. They, they did the me and Tebow on the Simpsons. You know, at Saturday Night Live doing the band thing, twice. Uh, he bought me one of the original cells for my birthday one year. He got it from the guy. Um, so that became like a thing, you know. And, and if I'm known to people in America when I'm walking around, it's because of that. Ten years on television. Television is now it's kind of certainly on a par with the internet. But at, in those days, before the internet, that was the most important thing in America. That was the the most powerful information vehicle in America was television. That's where people learned about stuff from. You always look like you were having such a good time too. You have this giant smile on your face. Like there's what's worse going jobs. Your head? When I used to work for <laughs> Uncle Eddie and drive those trucks, you know, and I'd get those fifty pound crates of celery with the wire and you cut your hand and stuff. This is a way better job <laughs> doing this here. All right, let's take a short break and then we'll talk more about SNL. Good. All right, so off camera, we were talking a little bit about arrangements you did for Saturday Night Live. Right. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, because I'm not a schooled musician, I can't sit down and actually write out an arrangement. But after I'd been on Saturday Night Live a couple years and had worked with people like Leon Pandarva, Steve Ture, the, the fabulous trombone player there, Steve would help me. Cheryl, certainly, she'd sit me down. Both her and Leon would sit me down at the piano and say, here. I know the piano, I know the notes on the piano, you know, here, these how they, see how this chord leads to this, and then you can do this, and it brings you to, oh, boom, and the little thing would open up, you know? Um, so, Lenny, I worked with Lenny a lot, Pickett, doing arrangements, and then for a lot of those band shot things that we did, I had old records that I loved that I either I knew that either very few people were aware of these records or only a small segment of other insane musician people like me had this record, you know. So I'd bring the record in and we had what they call takedown guys. And they would list they people there are people who can listen to something and just write it down. Like Mozart. They hear it and this violin player named Andy Stein, and I did a, a Django Reinhardt tribute thing with him. And he would, I'd put something on and he'd go, hmm. write it out, play it. To me, that's like, oh man, because me, I got to sit down with it and listen to it and live with it for a few days, and you know, it takes me a while to learn. So I was always fascinated by those people. So that's how we, we got arrangements done. And then if we wrote something, I would sit there with Lenny or Lou Delgado, who, who was the contractor on the band. He was also the uh, baritone sax player. And Lou and me would sit there and, and I'd play it for him and he'd write it out and then we'd get it to the arrange, the guys who actually write out by hand the arrangements. I'm sure they got a computer that does it now, but back then you had to write it out. Um, and everybody got paid, see that? That's what was good about doing arrangements. Howard told me when I first got on the show, he says, make sure you write a piece of music for every single show. Make sure you got one thing in there that you wrote and you own the publishing. Uh, somehow, NBC wasn't taking our publishing, wasn't taking part of the publishing. You know, I owned 100% of my publishing. And that was fantastic because residuals, you get paid every time they show, and they show those over and over, every time they show them, you know, for years. It's not a huge amount of money, but you're getting a taste, you're getting a taste, and that can keep you going in, in those times when you're not working. Because mm -hmm. we don't work all the time, musicians. You know, we have these great runs that people see us and like, oh man, that guy must be rich, he must be on top of the They don't know about the months and months where there's nothing, nothing. The phone does not ring. January, February, March, a lot of times, there's not much going on. Did you ever have any influence on booking the musical guests for Saturday Night Live? I did. Uh, me and Lauren would talk about people. Um, there was a band, there was one week where the band, whoever it was, something happened and they couldn't come. I don't even remember who it was and they couldn't come. And this is like Wednesday and we need a band for Saturday night. And they're calling around 
and they're trying to, and everybody they want to get is busy already. You know, the people that are doing real good, well, they're already working Saturday night. So uh, I've been listening to this band from Wisconsin, and right now I can't remember their name. It was this father-son rock and roll band, kind of a throwback to the 50s kind of a thing, but cool guitar sounds and stuff. And I got them on. I got them on. Another time, I'll tell you the, the reverse of that nice story, there was a band. Should I say their name? Yeah, why not? They were called the Bottle Rockets. And uh, great. I love this band. They made some great records. I, I, play, I played one of their songs last night. And um, I wanted to get them on. So I played the music for a couple of the people that would need to hear it, and they liked it. And uh, OK, let, let's get a picture. So I get a picture of them. And they, they were like from, I think, Missouri or somewhere. And these were not actors, photogenic. You know, let's move to LA and make a lot of money, guys. These were like guys from Missouri, you know, and the word came back, nah, we ain't putting them on TV. Those guys were missing teeth and beards and stuff. Back then, it was not cool for a guy to have a beard, you know, like it is now. Um, so, you know, show business is tough. It's tough. Is there anyone else who really would have liked to have been on the show? I don't remember. I'm sure there was. Yeah. I'm sure there was, but I don't remember. I tend to, um, if stuff doesn't go well or doesn't happen, I just forget that. You know, just remember the good stuff because there's enough of that. Mm -hmm. So tell us what a typical work week was like for Saturday Night Live. Yeah, it was very. By the time I got there, you know, by by the by the late '70s, they had developed a way to do the show. The show you'd often hear the show does itself. The show does itself. You've got writers. There's a bunch of writers. Um, back when I was there, most of them had gone to Harvard. Uh, you've got the cast, whoever they are at the current time. A lot of them from Second City, from Chicago, a lot of people out of Toronto. Um, then the occasional Californian, the Dana Carvey types would come in, you know. Great guy, Dana. And uh, so you got, you got those two groups. That's basically everybody that's up there, the cast and the writers. And then the music department, which was myself, Cheryl, Hal Wilner, and a guy named John Zonars, who worked with all of us, just kind of making sure that we knew what we were doing. And uh, so Monday. The writers would start writing. We just did a show on Saturday night. Writers would start writing. I didn't have to do anything on Monday, usually, unless there had been some terrible mix-up at the show and there was a meeting or something like that, but that was rare. You know? Do you recall what one of those would be like? They weren't bad. It was just like, why did this happen? You know, how, What can we do to avoid this happening? It wasn't like you got yelled at by the teacher. It wasn't, and at least, I don't know how it is now, but. I would, I would assume it's pretty much the same. There's this very kind of uh, Ivy League college dorm thing kind of going on up there. And you've got the good kids and you've got the bad kids. You know? You've got um, the kids who really buckle down and work, Phil Hartman, uh, Dana in my day, you know, um, uh, Mike Myers, work. They sit in their office and they work on their stuff and they write and they go to somebody else and then, yeah. and then you've got the bad boys, you got me and Chris Farley and and people like that, you know, and we're getting high and we're like fooling around and laughing and, and where where the fuck are they, you know? They're supposed to be. Where's Farley, you know? Funniest human being, uh, Belushi. People said back, you know, when I knew him, oh, John will do anything for a laugh. And I thought at the time that was true. Uh -uh. When I met Farley, he would do anything, <laughs> anything. There's nothing you can think of that he wouldn't do. Uh, when um, I think it was Sharon Stone was on the show, and, and she had just done, uh, what's that movie? 
Basic instinct. Where she crosses her legs, yeah. Mm -hmm. She's coming off that, right? So she's like the hottest thing in town. And when the actors uh, or whoever was hosting would arrive, you know, people would greet them. There, there was always make sure that a few, at least, of the cast are there, and sometimes me and whoever, and you greet them. When, I'm pretty sure it was her, when she came, Anyway, uh, Farley goes in the bathroom and he blows his nose. So he's got a big booger hanging down off his nose. And he goes, Gary, you know, how are you? Fool, man. He would do anything. He was so funny. There's stuff I can't even tell you that he did that we were just. Tell us, tell us. I can't. <laughs> I can't. No, it's, it's, but he would literally do absolutely anything. There was no line. He was the funniest person and a sweetheart. What a great guy. Anyway, the, the show. So Monday, not much happens. Certainly in my world, nothing happened. Tuesday, the writers are really down to it now. Wednesday afternoon, there's this big meeting, and it has a name. And right now, I'm blanking on what the name of this meeting is. Everybody comes, all the writers. And they put out their ideas. And Lauren is there. And people are listening. And there's a head writer, always. It was Jim Downey. Most of the years I was there, Harvard guy. And um, that's it, you know, because it's all about the writing and show. That's kind of what it's about, at least for the people that work there. And Thursday, then I start really working. Now, Wednesday, if there's ideas that have music in them, well then Cheryl and myself and whoever else is, you know, Hal Wilner, we got to get on it and start creating music for this or getting pre-existing, pre-recorded music for it and whatever we need. And uh, Cheryl and I would often meet and sit and talk about that. Okay, well this one obviously Cheryl is you. It's a Broadway thing with, and she knows that music inside out. She would, yeah, we'll do this, you know. She'd just sit down and do it, perfect, always. Um, Thursday, the guest band comes for camera blocking. Get there about 11 o'clock Thursday morning. 11 o'clock in the morning is not prime time for some musicians, you know, especially the younger guys that have just kind of first tasted success and they've gotten some money and accessibility to every vice, you know, 11 is not good for them. So they'd be like, uh, uh, and you have to do the song several times. And Nirvana was on twice. And they were fantastic. They were good live. But I remembered, you know, Dave Grohl, he's like a puppy dog. He's always ready to rock, you know. But uh, Chris and Kurt were not thrilled with being there and having to play the song over and over, especially it was not, not a big one. So that, Thursday's that, camera blocking for the band. And continuing, sets are being built now. The carpenters, the electricians, they're working their ass off, getting the show up, getting it built. Friday, they're doing run-throughs. They're starting to, the host is there. The host has come. Uh, the host is at that meeting on um, Wednesday the big writer's meeting. The host is there and the host gets to go, oh yeah, that's funny, I'll do that or, no, I won't do that. You know? And then they try to talk him into doing it. Um, and then Saturday is madness, you know, of getting ready for that. There's a, uh, that was in my day anyway, I'm sure it's still the same, there was a uh, 7.30, I think, run through, real time, on camera, in case there was a disaster, a set disaster or something in the air show and they had to broadcast the recorded one from that. that if that ever happened, I don't remember it happening. The show was really live in my day. There was no um, delay at all. They in eventually instituted, I think, a seven second delay. But there was no delay when I was there. Uh, so Saturday was just the, the actors and the host 
are rehearsing like crazy. The crew, the, the, you know, the carpenters, the electricians, the makeup people, the, the wardrobe people are going insane trying to get everything ready because it's live. At 11.30, boom, Joe Dixon went 10 seconds and it was 10 seconds later and you were on and all those, you know, out there in TV land. Mm -hmm. So that's how the week went. I'll tell you a good story yeah. about uh, the host coming. I think the host came, the host would come either Tuesday or Wednesday morning. They would come usually, you know, just before this meeting. Read through, it's called. The writers meet, read through. So there was a, a, a really iconic actor that may be too much before all your time to remember, Robert Mitchum. He was something. You've seen those movies, right? I mean, he was really something. And Robert Mitchum also had done a couple of records of like weird kind of Caribbean music and stuff. So I was really excited about Robert Mitchum. And uh, He's gone now, so I'll tell this story. He, as part of his package, you didn't, you didn't get paid a whole lot to come and do set, to host Saturday Night Live. I mean, you got something. Everything uh, there was unionized and scale, and then you'd get whatever else, you know. But it wasn't a huge payday to do the show every week necessarily. It was decent, you know, if you got to be a known actor on there, and I was making good money after a while, you know. Um, but for the actors, certainly, the thing that Chevy Chase had done in the 70s, he was only on the show for one year, and then he went to Hollywood and started doing movies and made money, real money, because that's where the real money is in, in, in Hollywood, in the films. So that became, oh, the, you get on Saturday Night Live and then you go to and make movies. And so how many of them have done it? Lots of them, you know? Lou Will Ferrell, right? People like that. Lots of them have done it. Mike Myers. Um, so anyway, Robert Mitchum is going to be on. And I'm really excited about this. And part of his deal, you know, you get a car that picks you up, you stay in at a great hotel and all that stuff. When he walks, his manager, like, had sent this missive, you know, about what, when he walks in, there must be a case of Herradura gold tequila available, and you will hand him an envelope with, I forget how much money, it wasn't a huge amount of money, less, $2,000 or something in cash, and he's yours. He's a good guy, he's going to do whatever you guys want him to do, he's into it, wants to do it. His daughter, Trina, had been friends with a lot of the Saturday Night Live people. I knew her and stuff, so he was, you know, wanting to do the show. Uh, so I'm there that day, you know, waiting. You know, and you'd always hear on the little inner office intercom, you know, Mitchum's car just pulled up. Okay, he's in the elevator. Somebody's helping him. You know, they're walking him through. They don't want him to get lost in the building. They bring him up to the 17th floor where the office is, and he comes in, and I forget who it was. Somebody from the show. Mr. Mitchum, you know, thank you so much for coming. And well, great, you know, and he's he had this beautiful clothes on, this gold sport coat, woven, amazing. And he just kind of stands there looking around. Mr. Mitchum, your tequila is over here. Great, I'll have a drink later. He just stands there looking around. And I know who's got the money, right? And I go, Give him the fucking money, okay? That's what it said when he walks in. Yeah. Walk over, Mr. Mitchum. Thank you. Okay, what do you guys want to do? <laughs> you know? He's so cool. He was old time, you know, real classy. Not arrogant, just classy. There's a difference, right? So you and the band would often um, back up the musical guest. Yeah. Was there ever any kind of style or genre of music that you were like less comfortable playing, or were you kind of game for everything? Oh, I'm game. Yeah. I think I said that before. I was game from the beginning about music. I had a sign that I had the art department make on Saturday Night Live that said, all kinds of music played here. Where I lived downtown here in Manhattan, I lived up on the 11th floor and down on the the street level was a deli, and in the side was a neon sign that said, all kinds of sandwiches made here. So I said, Keith Raywood, who was the art guy, 
I said, uh, make me a science, there's all kinds of music played here. So that was there for the 10 years I was there. It's <laughs> great. So yes, but getting to, to play with um, the, uh, the guest bands was my favorite. That was great. So you let's know. talk about some of those. I'm going to just name some of the yeah. musical guests and tell me what you remember. Um, Eddie Van Halen. Eddie came because Valerie Vertinelli was his wife at the time, and she was the host. Eddie wasn't scheduled to be on the show. After a time, this was, Eddie was like well into my 10 years somewhere, right in the middle maybe. Um, I was there from 85 to 95. Eddie came with her. Eddie was bored. It's easy. He's not doing anything, right? He's like, he doesn't want to follow his wife around like a puppy dog. So he finds out about the music office. And he comes over and hangs out, you know, because you can do whatever you want in the music office, you know. We're in there drinking, smoking, whatever. And uh, so hanging out, I had a, a guitar is always in there. So he'd sit, and he'd sit in the couch and play. And he was comfortable there. It was his people, band guys. He got that. It was, he could relax. So at some point, we start talking. Hey, man, I said, why don't you do something? With because it had gotten to where we're doing these band shots. And the show had become quite successful by about 88, I'd say. Again, it had been very successful. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh, they would allow me to invite anybody I wanted to come sit in with the band. So whenever there was a great guitar player in town, I would invite him to come sit in. And this wasn't in, it used to be TV Guide was this magazine that came out. There was no internet, so you couldn't look it up on the internet. And it didn't say in TV Guide that, that whoever it was was going to be David Gilmore is going to be playing with the band. No, it didn't say that. The camera would come up for the first band shot, and there's these people, whoever it was. And for the musicians, that was a cool thing. Um, a couple of the guys from Metallica told me that, that there were times when they would like had come off stage and they would get on the bus and turn on the TV to see who was playing with the, with the band that week. You know. So anyway, Eddie was there with Valerie. And it was just a natural thing. I mean, he's one of the great guitar players, so why am I not going to put him on? Of course I'm going to put him on. Mm -hmm. So we did that. And he had a little lick that he had written. Something like that. Something like that. And we took that, and I'm sure we got with Lenny Pickett on that one. And then we wrote an, I wrote another section to that song, and Lenny arranged the, the horn parts, and then there we were. And there's dress, and there's air, right? There's two shows Saturday night. So at dress, it was fantastic. It was ridiculous how good it was. Eddie was, he's a master, he really is. At air, it was great. I mean, it was super high quality, but he made a tiny little mistake. He dropped one. He just forgot, like, exactly where this one very intricate little thing. Nobody would even know about it, you know. Maybe three people in the United States went, oh, where did he make a mistake? Nobody else knew. He was so upset that he had made a mistake in that. But it was great. That was really fun. Anyway. Um, Keith Richards. Keith didn't sit in with the band. Hmm. No, he was on uh, when he had the expensive winos. When he did that, the, the Keith, the first solo album, his new solo album just came out, and it's great. Um, Keith was on. Now Keith Richards, if you're a guy like me, there's the icon. You know, that's that's it. You know, that's the ultimate white boy rock guitar player is Keith Richards. Everything about him, the moves, the way he wears the guitar, the guitars he plays, you know, everything. His playing is fantastic guitar player. What people don't know about Keith, he's an electric guitar player. That's how people know. He's one of the best acoustic guitar players I've ever heard. His right hand, the stuff, he, and he plays with a pick. He can finger pick, but he does play with a pick a lot. The stuff he does, 
And then, so the winos are on. So they, they're just to our right. Okay, stage right. Audience left. Stage right. There's a big curtain, big, heavy stage curtain in between the two. And like uh, many curtains, there's a slit in the middle of it in case they need to move staging. You know, they can pull it back in. But it's closed, and you just see, you, you'd think it was just solid curtain. So we're doing the band shot, coming into the commercial break right before Keith and the Winos are going to be on. And it, it was a song I had written, a song called The E-Town Crawl. And we just were catching it. You know, some nights the stuff just works. We were catching it. We were kicking. And I was, I was playing some stuff with T-bones, honking away on the bass. We were having a good time. All of a sudden, I see that little slit in the curtain part. He sticks his face out. He looks at me. He goes, don't play that good before I come on. You know, it was great. What a compliment. It was the ultimate compliment from a guy like that. You know? He was going, you sound good. Fuck you. Play like that before me. That was great. He's a great guy, Keith. Al Green. Al Green. I, I always loved Al Green, and I loved those records. Um, he was on twice, I think. We played with him both times. And uh, one time he was only gospel. He's one of those artists that's gone through phases where he will only do his religious music, because he's also a, a preacher you know, in, in Memphis. Um, he's great too. I've gone great. And then there was another time where, where we played secular music. But Al, one of the great voices, and and somebody whose records I had studied, and I really knew the guitar parts and the the feeling of that Memphis playing. There was a guitar player named Teeny Hodges who played on those records. And the first time Al was there as we're like setting up and stuff and you know getting to know each other I'd throw in some teeny Hodges stuff you know I'd throw those little things and he'd go I haven't heard that in years you know <laughs> stuff like that so we had a good time Buddy Guy Buddy was fantastic now Buddy was Buddy a guest on the show I don't think I think he was one of the people he was in town and I invited him to sit in with us could be I'm sure that's what it was I didn't know Buddy before that. We hadn't met. Or maybe we had met somewhere and I invited him when you're in town, come on, maybe like that. Buddy came on and was great and he liked the band because it was a great band, you know. Um, and we went up, we, we played some live shows and made a record of it. Paul Simon. Paul Simon. Now, I had known Paul since back in the Gilded days. Mm -hmm. Paul lived right down the street from uh, where me and Gilda lived. And uh, Paul is a genius, an actual genius, he is. Uh, he's, he's somebody that has so much innate intelligence that I think it's overwhelming to him sometimes. I got to play with Paul one time and I had this guitar that I had gotten, an old, beautiful Gibson guitar, and I wanted to play it on the song. And Paul's, like I say, he's so smart, and his ear is so good, he went, you know, that guitar, that's great, and it's a beautiful guitar, but I think you'd be better playing a Fender, you know, playing your Fender on, on this song. And I'm ashamed to say I kept the Gibson and played the Gibson, I think, I think I did. So I'm, I'm always, I've always been embarrassed about that, but I still, when I see Paul, we're, we have a nice rapport between us. He's made some of the greatest American records. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The replacements. The replacements. Um, guest band, I didn't play with them. Mm -hmm. They were, uh, I, somebody I loved, I had pushed to get them on. That's one of the bands I had definitely pushed to get them on. I think the record companies would probably put in those days, you know, the record companies would also be bombarding the show because it was where you could showcase a new act or an act that had a record coming out. And uh, they came on. Now, I'm not 
talking out of school when I say they were known as a drinking band. And on Thursday, they had kept their, themselves together pretty good at camera blocking. They, they were, were another band that was not happy about having to play the song several times in a row. But they, Paul Westerberg is enough of a pro that he got them through it. I love his writing. I love their songs, the sound of that band. And Saturday, they did the, the dress rehearsal and it was okay. But when it got to the air show, by then it had been too long in the dressing room and too much beer. And uh, the guitar player actually fell down on the way out to the stage and fell on his guitar and broke his guitar. And I think I gave him one of mine to play or something. There was a guitar that was around and we gave it to him to play and he played on that. And they still sounded great because they were used to playing that sloppy drunk. You know, they were used to that. So they were fine. But um, there were some scary moments before yeah. some of the guest bands got on. <laughs> Because you'd get Shane McGowan, or you'd get the Pogues, or the uh, replacements, or people like that, and it could be uh, a great story. Brian Ferry, who had been in the band Roxy Music, the English singer, and he was on. And uh, I had put together a really special band for him because he has a certain sound. It's this very lush. It's still a rock and roll band, but it's lush, and you need certain instruments, uh, synthesizers, and you need percussion, congas and shakers and things. So we had not only a drummer, but we had a percussion player as well. And then whatever else was in the band. Everything goes great. We do Thursday, we do the dress rehearsal. It's really good. He's happy, everybody's. Comes his second song on air and one minute, Joe Dixo, we're on stage, we're ready, but the percussion player is not there. And the percussion player starts this song. It starts with this percussion. I think it was Avalon. It was that song, Avalon. Sammy Figueroa. He's not there. I'm looking around. I'm like, please let him run in, you know. He's not there. I'm saying, was he upstairs? Was he in the dressing room? Yeah, he was. 30 seconds. We're not stopping. It's live TV. I'm thinking, what am I going to do? Chris Parker was playing drums. He was the house drummer in our band. He was playing drums. I look around. I see Steve Jordan, the great drummer, producer. He produces the Keith Richards stuff, you know, many other things, John Mayer. Um, I see Steve is in the back. I go, Jordan, I yell, yo, Jordan, come. I know him, you know, come. What? He said, I said, come here. I go, Chris, you play percussion because you know the intro. I said, Steve, sit down. He'll start it. Kick it. Bang. That was five seconds when Steve got on stage. Joe Dixon, five seconds. Mm -mm. Wow. We did it. <laughs> we hit it. That was great. Philip Glass. Phil Glass, he's self-contained. I mean, did we do anything with him? I don't remember. I don't think so. Maybe the horns. Certainly not me. Sting. Sting. Uh, I was actually, I think at that time, living in the same building. Or was, yeah, I was. I was living in the building where Sting was living. And again, a guy that I'm very uh, kind of in awe of his talent, you know? So... It was great. He's always very, he's a guy, you know, he's a band guy. So he gets it. He's much more, obviously, but he gets that. So we can hang out and talk. That's easy. <laughs> Elvis Costello. Elvis Costello. Great. I think the very first show Elvis Costello ever played in the United States was at a place called the Oxford Ale House in New Haven, Connecticut. And my band at that time that I was in up in Connecticut, the Scratch Band, we opened for him at that show. We were huge fans. We did some of his songs. And we told him, hey, we do, you know, watching the detectives and Allison and this and that. And he went, oh, good, do them so I don't have to. So you get tired of playing the same thing, the same thing, right? So, again, a, a, a band guy, a very nice guy, you know, super intelligence, again, you know. 
these people aren't successful, most of them aren't successful just by luck. They needed some luck, but there's always a basic intelligence at, at work somewhere in there for most of them. Anyway, uh, Elvis was great. T-Bone had been working with him, had been on, on the road with him. So we were friendly and close. It, that was very nice. And we, uh, he had a song called Veronica that we did where I got to play 12 string and we played. That was really fun. Mick great. Jagger. Mick. Um, it's like Keith, you know, the Rolling Stones. I was a huge Rolling Stones fan. From the first day their first records came out in the United States, I had those records. I studied them. I know every song. Every song. You know, I know the stuff inside out. I can play the bass part. I can play the rhythm guitar. I can play the lead guitar stuff. I know all the words, you know. So I, um, what year was Mick on? Do you know? Do you have that? I don't have that here. So I had either already played on his records or was going to play on his records in the next week or something, you know. So I, I knew Mick from that. I kind of had met him a couple times around town and uh, had, had done some work. Uh, myself and Jeff Beck had played guitar on a couple of his albums and quite nearly gone on tour, but it didn't, it didn't work out. But we had rehearsed in England and stuff. And, uh, but yeah, great. Mixed the greatest. Tracy Chapman. Tracy Chapman, I knew from early, early in her emergence because Elliot Roberts, who managed her, also managed me for a minute. He's from Los Angeles. He managed Neil Young forever, Joni Mitchell. So I knew Tracy and definitely loved him. She's a talent. Mm -hmm. Real nice person, too. Got more. to play on one of her records at some point, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Um, in, in L.A. Stayed at the Roosevelt. Nice. First time I ever stayed. <laughs> All right, a couple more. Uh, Cypress Hill had some controversy during their appearance. Do you remember that? Yeah, I mean, it seems so silly now. You know, they had controversy because they had a song about weed. I mean, now that it's legal in a lot of places and they sell it in stores, it seems like a joke. But yeah, that used to be a big deal. But they were, they were, they were good. I mean, they came and delivered. I remember they were, they were easy to work with. They were, you know, they were guys that like to get high and sing. Aerosmith. That ain't new. <laughs> That's been going on for a long, long. You read the Greeks. You read the ancient Greeks. You know they talk about going down to Egypt and getting the uh, in uh, in Ulysses. They go to Egypt and they, they I forget how is it said the uh, the balm of sleep or something. It's opium. You know, mm -hmm. heroin. They're doing heroin in, in, in Ulysses. You know, so getting high and and um, you know being a musician has been there forever. Mm -hmm. And being a human has been there forever. Aerosmith. Aerosmith, now that was really fun because uh, Mike Myers had written Wayne's World. It was brand new. And him and Dana were gonna be, you know, the Wayne and Garth, right? Mm -hmm. Down in the basement. And um, Mike had come to me and he said, I, I need a theme song for the show and it's gotta be dumb. I said, I'm glad you came to me, you got the right guy. <laughs> and he said, all it's gonna say is, Wayne's World, Wayne's World, excellent, excellent. Wayne, over and over, Wayne's World, Wayne's World, excellent, and party time, excellent. I said, okay, fine. So I wrote a very dumb thing with Mike, and uh, then that week, Aerosmith was the guest. So Mike said, he asked him, he said, why don't you guys like come down to Wayne's World and play the theme? And they went, sure, you know. They're, they're just guys that want to have a good time, right? So they did. They played, and I got to play with them. And so for five minutes, I was an Aerosmith. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Yeah. They're nice guys. They're real, like, you know, they came up through the bars and the wars of, you know, the Boston, New England band scene. So they're, they're the real thing. Could you play the Wayne's World theme for us? You could play the Wayne's World <laughs> theme. Wayne's World, Wayne's World, party time, excellent. I don't even know if those are the right chords, but that's the basis. It's just, you know. 
great. A um, few more. Eric Clapton. Eric Clapton. Um, by the time Eric was on, I already knew Eric because I had played with Bob Dylan and done some things with Eric. And I might have done a couple other things with Eric. Now, Eric, for a guy like me, for a guitar player, that's kind of intimidating, you know, because he's sort of the one of the ultimate guitar people for my generation, you know. Uh, but he, he was great, and he was on a couple times. And I remember the one time, it was, must have been 92, and he had done this album called From the Cradle. So he'd gone back and done this straight blues. And it was great, really great record. Now Eric was using at that time, I think he still uses a very particular kind of old Fender amp that was made in the late 50s. And I have all those old amps, you know, because I started buying them when they were free. You know, in the 60s, you could buy those for nothing. Now they're thousands and thousands of dollars, but they were 30 bucks back then, you know. Anyway, uh, through channels or whatever, they had sent me the message, hey, do you have one of these amps? Could Eric use it? Sure, no problem. So I get the amp up there, and it's a real good one. You know, they're, they're, they sound different. They're all the same looking, but they sound different. Every one sounds different. Like it. Uh, these guitars are all different. You can get 20 of this exact same model from the same month, from the same year, and they're all different. Anyway, so yeah, this is a really good one. So Eric and the band come. They've had customs problems. They've been sitting at the airport for six hours or something. They were up all night. They played the night before in England. You know, it's, it's like... They are fried. They are not happy that they're at Thursday camera blocking at 11 in the morning. Okay, so they're going to do a Buddy Guy song called Five Long Years. So Eric looks at the end. My amp, it's, it's a really good sound, but it's a little ragged. It's been around. You know, it's pretty beat up. I used it a lot. So he kind of looks at it like, oh, Christ, what's this going to be? You know, and he plugs in. Boom! He hits the first note. And his whole band just woke up and went, Wow, that's good. What is that? And he goes, man, that's ringing like a bell. And he turns over, you know. So uh, he was really happy about that. And uh, I don't know, I've, I've gotten to do a, a few, back in those days, I got to do some things with Eric, and, and it was really fun. You know, what an what a honor for me, you know, to get to play with these people, all these people that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I played with Madonna, too, on the show. I didn't play with Madonna, did I? I didn't play with her? Well, she was the guest. She was the guest. Yeah. No, we didn't. Did you have any interaction with her? We didn't play with her, no. Mm. Or maybe if a couple of our people did. Sometimes they would just use you know, like one or two people. It wouldn't be the whole band. Right. They would just fill in whatever they needed. She might have used keyboard players. She might have used uh, Pan and, and Cheryl. Did you work with Springsteen when he came on? No, no. He had a band, and at that point he was doing a, a small band thing. I remember when he was on. It was maybe a four piece of real standard rock unit, two guitars, bass, and drums. Mm -hmm. And then what do you recall from when Sinead O'Connor was on the show? Um, we knew she was going to do something. You know, it wasn't a complete surprise. We knew she was going to do something, but we didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. She might have done something in rehearsal, something. And she was just, you know, a person who had, had some beliefs about things and uh, wanted to seize that moment live. There's no delay. She knows that whatever she does is going to go out. I think she could have been much more effective if she thought about it a little more. Because ripping up a picture that was the Pope, right? Of the, the guy that was the Pope at the time. Okay, I get it, you know, but she's coming from Ireland, from this kind of like very focused thing that she's wanting to shine a light on and protest about. And I think she could have done, if she thought about it a little more, I think it could have been a lot more effective. And don't ever, I'm sure I'm not going to like uh, make you awestruck or anything when I say that they love it when that stuff happens. You know the old show business thing, it doesn't matter what they say as long as they're talking about you. Mm -hmm. That's the oldest show business adage there is. Doesn't matter. 
you know, see something terrible in the paper about somebody, they're laughing. Their publicist is laughing <laughs> because, oh, everybody wants to read that terrible thing. Well, now everybody's talking about you. You know what? You're going to make money because of that. I mean, unless you fill spectrum, you kill somebody. That's, you can't <laughs> take it that far. But pretty much up to that point, you can, you can go. So yeah, the, Lauren and the, the NBC would pretend like they were all upset when that stuff happened. They loved it. Do you have any favorite musical moments from the show? Either so many, so many. Yeah. Um, playing with Al Green, playing with Ricky Lee Jones. Um, I always think I could have done a better job with everybody. You know, I always think back and go, oh, I could have. You know, I could have. Um, Ricky Lee Jones is a very, like Paul Simon, very focused musician. She really knows music and knows what she wants it to sound like. And I could have, I wish I could have been, you know, better for her and better for her. But with Al Green, I know we had a great time. The Costello thing, there were other people that we played with. It was, you know, it was kind of a dream job for me. I was really, you know, again, so lucky to be there to get to play, and after a while, you know, after about 88, 89, in there, I could do whatever I wanted. Nobody ever said a word to me about play this, don't play that. At some point, NBC got sold. I don't remember. Somebody had owned it, Mitsubishi or Sony or somebody had owned it and sold it, or Sony bought it, I don't remember who it was. All of a sudden, this show that's been this college dorm putting on a show in the, in the student union that weekend, all of a sudden it's become this, about this was I think the seventh year I was there, 92, 93 in there. It's become this corporate mentality thing and all around in NBC. And of course that seeped into Studio 8H in the 17th floor, less on the 17th floor, they were afraid to come in there. So they might have to be like us. And, uh, but certainly in the studio, you got more of that sense that there was a, a guy with a clipboard writing things down about what you were doing. So after I'd been there for seven years, I didn't, I really didn't want to do it anymore. And uh, a couple times I had tried to leave the show and Lauren had talked me into coming back. Because I wanted to play live. I'm a, I'm a musician that enjoys playing live. I enjoy going on the road. I enjoy all that. So mm -hmm. So then in 95, you said Lauren called you. 95, Lauren called me up in August, probably, or something like that, September. Because the show usually starts up right about now, in October. I think the last show, or the first show of the season was the other night, right, with Miley mm -hmm. Cyrus. Miley Cyrus is amazing. You know, she's, she's running that image thing, you know, for all she can. But she's also really talented. She was on the 40th anniversary show. She did this Paul Simon song, 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover. And she was as far away from me as you are singing that song. I'm sitting there with the house band, and they were right in front of us. They didn't do use the guest band station. They were right in front of us. And she was just, just plain, just some jacket and pants, and sang the shit out of that song. And I had this cool arrangement, and I went, yeah, Miley, do more of that. That's great stuff. You know, sticking your tongue out and wearing weird clothes and stuff, or not wearing weird clothes, you know. That, <laughs> that's kind of her thing, and that's smart. It keeps her, you read about her every day. But she'll deliver. She, she could do the long run if she wanted to. Off topic, I know. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, so in uh, 95, um, I got fired. A bunch of people got fired that at that point, I don't know, there was never a particular reason. You know, you're on the show for a while and you're not on the show anymore, that's fine. Did you feel like it had to do with that regime change from above or anything? I probably, there was something in there. I don't really, I never was given a reason. You know, there might not have been a reason. It was just time to change. Mm -hmm. They do have to change, you know, their demographic is 18 to 24, something like that. 35, yeah. Hmm? 18 to 35, I think. I wouldn't probably. go that far. Oh, okay, yeah. I think the demographic, at least when I was there, the demographic definitely ended 27. Yeah. Something like that. College age mm -hmm. is who they were aiming at, mm -hmm. you know? 18 to 35, that's millennials, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, now. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, so it was just time, you know. And although it was it was a kind of a shock, I was getting ready to go back, and it was a, certainly a financial disaster. You know, I was making a lot of money by that point because I knew how to work that system by that point and do arrangements and do different things to every week was, you know, maybe that's why they fired me. I don't know. But um, it, ultimately, it was so the right thing to do because then it allowed me to get back out and play live mm -hmm. and go back out on the road and do what I, what I like to do. Mm -hmm. You did come back for several of the specials, though. You mentioned the 40th anniversary. Yeah, no, I was on the 25th anniversary I was mm -hmm. on, you know. Mm -hmm. In 2000. So what do you think was your greatest contribution to the music of Saturday Night Live? Um, bringing to that band and then to, by the process, to whoever was out there watching it in America, um, real great bar band music. Blues, certainly blues. I, I played a lot of blues, you know. I, I had Buddy Guy on, you know. Um, those guitar players that I would have sit in, uh, Lonnie Mack, Johnny Winter, Eddie Van Halen, Buddy Guy, David Gilmore, uh, I'm sure there's other ones I'm forgetting. You know, I was, I was doing things for the cats <laughs> at heart. That's the small of it. And then when you took it into that process of American television, it went out. And it, I know that went into the culture. People, had, people come up to me all the time and say, man, I started playing guitar because of you. I mean, I hear that all the time in name any state. I think we ran out of film or something. Yeah, let's take a quick break. Let's take a quick break. <laughs> So uh, you actually toured with Bob Dylan while you were on Saturday yep. Night Live. How did you do that? 88, 92. Um, Bob Dylan. When I was a kid going to St. Matthew's grade school, I would carry Bob Dylan records around so that people would see them, they would see that I had Bob. You understand that thing? Mm -hmm. I wanted people to see that. His first 10 albums, probably, I knew every song. Every word could play it. It play all the parts, everything. Knew the stuff inside out. Uh, Elliot Roberts, who I mentioned, the manager, calls me one day at the office at Saturday Night Live. This would have been in maybe the spring of 88. Yeah. And uh, he says, hey, tomorrow night, can you get a bass player and a drummer and be at this, there's a rehearsal studio in town called Montana. Can you be at Montana about 10 o'clock? Uh, Bob is in town. I've never met Bob at this point. Bob is in town and he wants to play. I said, sure. Not a problem. I'm very excited. You know, this would be cool. So I get T-Bone and Chris Parker, the guys from the band. I say, tomorrow night, 10 o'clock, we're going to play with Bob Dylan up in Montana. Cool. Okay? So you know at 5, 10 minutes at 10, we are on that stage. Amps are on. We're tuned up. We're ready. There's no one there. There wasn't a um, receptionist. There was no one. You came up in the elevator and the place is dead empty, but it was unlocked. It was open just for us, as it turns out, you know. So we just kind of standing there and talking. I don't even think we played. We were, we were nervous, you know. This is Bob Dylan. This is, I can't compare his, um, iconic stature to anyone now in a similar, in, in music, you know, what Bob meant. They had put that thing on Bob, which I later talked to him about, the savior of a generation, you know. I mean, he was the guy that 
influenced the Beatles, you know. I mean, he influenced every, he was the guy. The whole 60s, 70s thing, Bob invented that. So we're standing there on the stage. And finally, at some point, after maybe 45 minutes, it was a pretty good-sized room, and it was dark in the back. Out of the darkness comes this guy with the hoodie. He's got the gloves with the fingers cut off, you know. Fingers sticking out so we can play with them. And he hands you the... Bob doesn't shake hands real hard, you know. He's one of those guys that just hands hand you the dead fish. All things which I would come to love later, you know. But at first it's like, well, that's weird. Uh, and he puts on his guitar. His guitar and amp were there already when we got there. He puts on his guitar. He starts kind of noodling around. He doesn't really say much to us. And we, we're kicking in behind him, you know. We can hear. We know what's going on. We're following him. And it's, it's okay, but it's a little herky-jerky and not pointed in any direction, you know. So after maybe a half hour or so of that, I'm thinking, boy, this is not going well here. This is, I don't know what he wants to do. Me and T-Bone are looking at each other like, buddy, what is this? So at some point, I'm standing right next to Bone. And Bob walks over to us and goes, so uh, you guys know Pretty peggy -O? And we both, like twins, would do. We go, sure. And he goes, you do? We go, yeah, we know Pretty peggy -O. Of course we know Pretty peggy -O. You know, That's who we are. We know Pretty peggy -O. We're the guys that know Pretty peggy -O. So he starts playing Pretty peggy -O, and we kick in, and Bone's singing harmony, and it's really good because we know pretty Peggy -o. this is old Civil War song the captain he is dead you know one of those come come running down the stairs combing back your yellow hair pretty Peggy -o. so we do that and Bob got happy you know and and he kept playing we played for hours without stopping it was really fun so we finally got out of there at some point early early in the morning and uh, we all go home. And we thought that was it, you know. It was a night Bob just wanted to play Pretty peggy -O and some songs. Next day, phone rings in the office. It's Elliot Roberts again. He goes, all right, you got the gig. I said, what? He said, you got the gig. He said, that was your audition. Didn't I tell you it was an audition? I said, no, Elliot, you did not tell me it was an audition, which I'm glad he didn't. He said, yeah, you got the gig. Well, what I eventually found out and I think that this is probably basically true, is Bob, had, Bob wanted to go from having a great big band. He had done tours with Tom Petty's band backing him up. He had done a tour with the Grateful Dead backing him up. From having a big, well-known band, he wanted now to just get a little, the standard rock unit, two guitars, bass, and drums, and he wanted to go out and play like that. So he had gone around the country and been auditioning guitar, bass, and drum units. And, and the question would always come, do you know Pretty peggy -O? And nobody else knew it. Me and T-Bone, we knew Pretty peggy -O. So that's apparently what got us the job. Although then T-Bone didn't ever do the tour. And it turned into four years I was there. It's what they call the never-ending tour. It's still going on. You know, I could still be there. Um, T-Bone didn't do it because he was hooked up with Daryl very tightly and, and they wanted to do things so I understand that but I missed him out there but Chris Barker did it the drummer and we went out with Bob logistically how were you able to do that and oh. still do Saturday Night Live Saturday Night Live uh, I think it's still the same was 20 shows spread from like October to May maybe and they're obviously on Saturday night Bob had Elliot talk to Lorne. Elliot and Lorne know each other. You know, big muckety mucks in the business all know each other, of course. Uh, and Bob said, just tell us, you know, Lorne knew in advance the whole season what nights those 20 shows are going to be. Tell us and we won't book shows. Those Saturday nights, Saturday night is the big money night. 
when you're out on the road. You can get more money on the weekend than you can get on a Wednesday, right? Bob didn't do shows because me and Chris would go back and do SNL. So I'm always just in awe of that little factlet mm -hmm. that, but Bob was, was great. He was very cool. He's Bob Dylan, you know. Uh, for like the first year I was there, you want me to talk about him at all? Yeah, sure. For the first year that I was there, he never really said much, you know. I mean, this was by 1988, you know, he's been one of the most famous people since 1961 or something. He's been through it all. Every bit of anything, the craziness, you know. You know, when you, when you get that famous, you can't go to the movies. You can't go pump gas in your car. Simple little things. You can't really go to the grocery store unless it's like your little local store where they're so used to that they've already all got your autograph and gotten the selfie with you in, you know? So anyway, about the first year, Bob doesn't really interact much with any of us in the band other than I would go in in the afternoon and we'd make up a set list wherever we were, you know, Fort Wayne, Indiana or Houston or wherever we were. I'd sit down with him and he'd say, well, what if we do this one or that one? And because I knew all the songs, I would suggest some stuff to him and sometimes he'd say yeah and sometimes he'd say no. So we'd start out electric. We would do an electric portion then uh, Chris, and the, uh, Chris Parker, the drummer and the bass player, who was initially a guy named Kenny Aronson, and then Tony Garnier got on, who's still there. Tony is still there. They go off, and Bob and I would come out with acoustic guitars. And there was a spot, right, on Bob. The rest of the stage is black, right? Just one spot, circle around him uh, from about three quarters front. So it's hitting him in the forehead, you know, so he's got those deep shadows, beautiful lighting. Huh? Casts a nice shadow behind him. I'm just on the edge of that circle of light to his right so I can watch his hands to see where he's going because Bob didn't really tell you what he was going to do, you know. And I'm out of the light. My face is out of the light, but my guitar is in the light so they can watch my hands if they want to. But it's not about me. It's about Bob Dylan. That's, you know way it should be. And we would just do anything. Whatever he wanted, he would just play any song. And I love that seat of the pants thing for myself, following people and just going. So uh, we went to, um, we were playing in London, England. And there were a lot of big time rock and roll people were there, you know. Um, everybody, pretty much. Because anywhere we go, Anybody from the music business would come to see Bob, you know, because that's Bob Dylan. His impact, as much as it's been on the culture, what he did for musicians is everybody was totally influenced. Somebody said there's like more than one Beatle standing in the wings, you know, stuff like that at this show. So we get to that little acoustic section in the middle, and I'm over on the side, and Bob's playing, and we're doing his song, Mr. Tambourine Man. And there's a, there's a line in there where he says, just to dance beneath the diamond sky with one hand waving free. I started crying. Making sure my face is out of the light, but there's like tears running down. I'm playing like, I'm here with Bob Dylan. And he's singing Mr. Tambourine Man. And I'm playing along. Couldn't believe it. You know? Yeah, I had a good time with Bob. That's great. Then eventually, um, I quit because it got to be too much, the running back and forth. Um, the show, Lauren, I, I tried, that was another time when I had tried to quit Saturday Night Live because Bob made me a very good financial offer to really join the band and, and stay and be around. A very good offer. And I talked to Lauren about it. And he said, oh, no, no, you stay here. It's going to be better. You'll make more money here and you'll get well-known because of the television, like many more people see you, you know. I don't like that. I probably wound up making almost as much money as I would have made with Bob, almost. Uh, and certainly did get more well-known. Mm -hmm. 
from staying and doing it and the television stuff. Mm -hmm. But that was great. To get to play with Bob was a dream. Mm -hmm. whole thing's a dream. Um, tell us a little bit about your work as musical director for the Emmys in 1988, I think. I don't much remember. We went, it was fast. We went to Los Angeles. It was a bunch of the LA cats, you know, great musicians. I am not a great musician. I'm a good guitar player, you know. I'm a good band guy. I play the band, I always say. I play the guitar, but I play the band. I know how to do that. I know how to arrange songs. And I know how to say to the drummer, you know, do this thing. And quarters on the hat, and, you know. I know how to talk to people. I love doing that. I love the music, and I love the guys, and the women that are in the bands, and you say, you know, play, you know, like with the major seventh in the right hand, you know. Awesome. So, uh, we went to Los Angeles. We did the Emmys. I don't much remember. I was not, I was way out of my element. I was not somebody that should have been doing that. I just got to do it because of the SNL and Lauren and everything. So we know you play the guitar. Mm. Do you play other instruments as well? I, I play string, things with strings on them, you know. I play, um, I've made money playing the guitar, six string guitar, I play bass. I play mandolin. I've made money on those instruments. There's a bunch of other instruments I fool with. I would never play violin in public, you know, but I play it a little bit. In 2007, Fender came out with the GE Telecaster. Yeah. What did that honor mean to you? It was insane. My mom bought me a Telecaster when I was a little boy, you know, and I always played a Telecaster. I made my whole career playing a Telecaster. So, yeah, that was such an honor. There was a guy that worked at Fender at that time named Mike Eldred. And I knew Mike from around, you know, from the guitar world. And, and so he got in touch with me and he said, let's do this uh, GE model. So I made it, and basically it's, to me, it's the ultimate kind of, that's an electric guitar right there, you know, solid, beautiful. It's everything you need it to be. So I didn't change a whole lot of stuff. You know, I did a couple little things to make it a little different. Mm -hmm. One little cosmetic thing that was nothing that I thought of. Leo Fender had done it in the 1948 on a little lap steel, a little steel guitar. I had that put on the neck that, instead of just plain dots, it had these little kind of desert American Indian kind of symbols. Did a thing with the electronics where this thing here is called a pickup because it takes the sound of the string vibrating, it turns it into electricity, sends it down through little wires, through these here as a volume and a tone to make it like darker or louder in your face. And it sends it out here and it goes down to your amplifier and your amplifier turns that little signal, it amplifies it into that great big loud sound. So. I changed a little bit the way this is done on the guitar, but basically it's the same old Fender Telecaster. So just a few summing up questions now. What are you working on these days, your current project? I've been working with um, Roger Waters, uh, the guy from Pink Floyd. Working with Roger for about five years. We did the, I was hired initially in s the summer of 2010 to do uh, to, he was going to do the Pink Floyd album, The Wall. He had designed this incredible production. And we were going to go out and we were going to do like about a three month tour and it turned into three years all over the world twice. Um, the second time we went to Europe, we did 22 countries in Europe. I didn't know there was 22 countries in Europe. Try to name 22 countries <laughs> in Europe, it's hard. We played Serbia, we played Croatia, we played in Split, Croatia. What? I never heard of Split before that. And it's a very cool little town. Um, Bulgaria, Romania, uh, all those places. Anyway, it was fantastic. And I've gotten to be really, really good friends with Roger. I think I've gotten closer to him than with anybody, pretty much, that I've ever worked with. We're really good friends. Roger is um, very concerned and, and he's very pro-veterans, uh, wounded veterans. 
So we will go down to Walter Reed Army Hospital down in Washington, D.C., military hospital, not just Army. Most of the guys that we work with are Marines. These are guys, so far we haven't worked with any women. There are women there, but we haven't worked with any women very specifically. There have been women veterans that work with us, singers. But all the musicians so far have, have been guys. Um, these are guys that got blown up when they were 18, 19. Legs gone, arm gone, arm crushed. They still want to play music or they learn to play music there. Do you know what the suicide rate on wounded, or just veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan is? The daily suicide rate, you're not gonna believe it. 22 a day, a day. I couldn't believe that. When, I, when they told me that, I said, what? And I asked a couple doctors that like, weren't part of our little deal. I said, what's the suicide? 22, imagine that. There's been millions of people have gone over there, of United States people have gone over there. And there's hundreds of thousands that got really wounded. So anyway, these guys wanted to do it. So they, they made this thing called Music Corps, like Marine Corps, Music Corps. And they do music. So Roger started going down there and he would take me with him. And I remember the first time we went, when we got back in the car afterwards, he went, that was heavy. Now we go down there and it's like, hey guys, what's going on, you know? And the first couple times we went, they were really leery of us, you know, who are these guys? What do they want? You know, because they're, they're very insular, because they're, they're Marines and they're Army and they fought the war together and I can't imagine what that was. They could tell me stories all day long, I still never know what that was. Um, we're doing a show uh, next week at the Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C. with these guys and some uh, Tom Morello, the great guitar player from Rage Against the Machine and The Night Watchman, his thing, uh, is playing with us, some other people. And, uh, you know, they have a band. We do stuff with them, but Roger really helped them get that off the ground. But it's great to see these guys, you know. Mm -hmm. And a couple of them have said to me, I'd have killed myself if I didn't have this. And they've been in the hospital since they got blown up. Five years, some of them. Four, five years, six years. That's a long time to be in the hospital. Mm -hmm. But they keep, the music helps them, I think, and I'm sure they do a lot of other things for themselves. You know, some guys just decide, We've seen them, you know, some of the guys aren't there anymore that we started with a couple years ago. So that's, but it's great, it's, and we have a good time with these guys because now that we're friendly with them, you know, now that they've gotten used to us and, and you know, us being just these two assholes that come down and play with them, you know, and then they got their thing, but we have a good time. And they have a wicked sense of humor because you've got to, you know, to, anybody has to, but especially, if you've had your legs blown off, you better have a sense of humor, you know, and they do. They do. So, I've been doing that stuff with Roger. I've been, I've been actually pretty busy with Roger. And I play, you know, I do a lot of different things. I get called on to put together bands for things, for events and different things, because I'm known as a guy that can do that. And I have a stable of people I know here, you know, that are really good musicians that can go, that kind of music, yeah. That kind of music, no problem. All kinds of music played here. <laughs> what advice would you give to someone who's just starting out in the music industry? Don't do it. Really? Yep. Go to school. Be something real. Why is that? Because it's a it's a pitiless industry. Pitiless. Make no mistake. Saturday Night Live, which we spend a good deal of time talking about here, isn't about comedy. It isn't about fame. It isn't about anything else you want to say. Music, it's about money. Money, that's it. It's not about anything else. Maybe the first couple months in 1975 when they were on, it was about smoking a joint and laughing. Not anymore. And hasn't been for many, many years. It's just about money. It's show business is merciless. Entertainment business is merciless. And it's, it's 
not unlike many other industries, you know, that, that exist, people that are really nasty people can get in positions of power. And when you run up against that, it's difficult, you know, and, and you can really get hurt. And also, it doesn't matter if you're talented. The most talented people probably don't make it. It's um, this endless series of coincidences and luck and knowing how to having, having the natural ability, which apparently I have, because I certainly never was able to work on it or anything, the natural ability to be able to get along with people. You know, I know that people, so many people have told me, I know it must be true, I can get along with people. I try to see the good in somebody until they really show me that it's not good. And I just go away, you know? So it's, it's such a difficult business to get in. And it, like I said, it doesn't matter if you're talented. That's got, it's got so little to do with that because I'm not that talented. And I've had a great career, you know? It's luck and it's, that interconnecting thing is a huge part of it. What would you say is your proudest career achievement? Um, making enough money to support my daughter. Yeah, my career? family, my wife and my daughter. Yeah. She's 13, Josie. She's the coolest. Does she play instruments? No. <laughs> she, she's got a beautiful voice, but she won't do it because uh, her mother sings too, you know, and uh, she just doesn't want to do it. Maybe someday. Do you have any career regrets about anything? Sure. Everything. Everything. I'd have done it. I'd have, I'd have done. I'd have worked harder. I'd have learned more. I'd have, I'd have been a better musician. Sure, the whole thing. But that's balanced by all the great stuff too. So our last question is: How would you like to be remembered? Way down the road, in a hundred years or something, I want some kid somewhere to be looking in one of those books, or they'll be online, or they'll just be thinking, and they'll be accessing the database, and they'll come upon a picture of a few guys in New York standing outside the studio in the summer of 1981 or something, and they'll look at it and go, those were the real cats. Thank you so much for sitting down with us today, GE. Thank you, Adrian. <laughs>